What is going on, everybody? Paul here, coming at you with a Crypto Coffee update, where we got all the news, conferences, events, all the good stuff coming at you, all with coffee as well. Look at that. I got a nice, like, oceanic kind of, I think I got this at an aquarium kind of mug today. So, yeah, join me for that simultaneous sip. Pretty low price for information, you gotta admit. Also, let's go ahead and uh, jump into this, but before we do, I wanted to say thank you guys so much for the support on the EOS video. I do not mean that sarcastically. Uh, it has attracted some individuals who are very enthusiastic, uh, but not necessarily providing the best sources. Definitely not all of them. So some of them have provided some excellent clarifying information that has led to a closer understanding of the reality of the situation. And after all, this kind of discourse is extremely, extremely healthy for any community in any space simply because if not if we all share the same opinion we don't have any diversity of opinion you ultimately end up with cognitive dissonance this can make an individual much less uh, suscept to new information that could potentially be correct as they view it less with an objective lens and more with a lens of well i just have the right information so what's this dude on about where still that can be reinforced if the alternative information isn't enough to uh, solicit you to change your opinion therefore creating a self um, self-enforcing cycle of cognitive dissonance. That's not good for truth and definitely can negatively impact how information is uh, promulgated in the crypto space and in any community or any industry for that matter. So really this diversity of opinion is super healthy. This conversation has been engaging, enlightening, and fantastic. So keep on bringing them sources, guys. And with that said, let's go ahead and jump into the article. Got Crypto Panic here. It's my uh, favorite news aggregation site. Fantastic stuff. Wanted to give them a shout out since they're always so helpful for getting all this stuff in order. Fidelity, we talked about that in the last or the one before Crypto Coffee update. That was pretty big news. Uh, we tried to drive it home. Well, I tried to drive it home the best I possibly could that this is really impressive because they've been in this since 2015. Actually, if you look down here, 2014, February, is when the initial research was conducted, which goes to show that this is a fantastic barometer. I'm glad that this is kind of sinking into the psyche of the wider crypto space because it goes to show that individuals, they're beginning to notice this information is starting to uh, spread around a bit more that... These institutions have been at it for a while, guys. They're not new to this space. I mean, February 2014, Bitcoin was like, yeah, just five years old then. So it's been double the amount of time since the point that Fidelity started looking into crypto. Just goes to show that that makes the individuals who are heading up these projects perhaps more seasoned than many altcoin investors out there, for one. And two, that this is a great barometer. A lot of these companies have been looking at this space, developing perhaps under lock and key their own proprietary systems that deal with this technology, thereby enforcing the value of the entirety of the crypto space. And when that breaks forth, that could be a very, very interesting thing to see and perhaps another wave of legitimacy for crypto as a whole. So with that said, oh, and this comes at a time when Bitcoin just turned 10 years old. So that's exciting. Good stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next article. BlackRock says they're waiting for market legitimacy to launch crypto ETF, which is fair enough. This kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, the market legitimacy that can be attained from institutional investment. Now, this can be good or bad. After all, uh, there's been debates about centralization. We on this channel have talked extensively about relative centralization, how decentralized is a decentralized system, how decentralized do your nodes have to be, um, is 20 one individuals decentralized that sort of stuff but suffice to say that once there is a quasi centralized custodial um, entity that is able to handle very large transactions that may need to be reversed or uh, augmented in some way shape or form on the part of these existing legacy financial institutions that's going to allow even more legacy money to enter the space so it's a kind of self-enforcing cycle in that way However, it's not necessarily good nor bad. It's simply how the market is behaving. So this helps to let us know that BlackRock CEO Larry Fink says he's just kind of waiting around, doesn't want to pull the trigger on anything prematurely, because again, this is a lot of money and a, uh, it's a big financial institution. They don't want to jump into something that can erode their legitimacy that they've spent decades and decades building up through positive net returns. So with that said... Bitcoin Cash price is surging. Um, you know, here we don't care too much about the short-term price. Really, we're looking at the technology. I'm bringing this up because of the underlying fork that has been much to the chagrin of some, to the excitement of others, that has some interesting technical underpinnings um, and some great, uh, great points of observation to be had from how the community is interacting, uh, not only within itself, but towards other communities as well. Uh, don't want to get too deep into the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, or Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Cash, uh, or Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin, depending on what side you're on, um, debate. But suffice to say that this is a fork that is occurring within the Bitcoin Cash community. And it is a split between how large the block size will be upgraded 
um, to this November. One side says, well, we need to go all the way to 128. The other side says, well, let's wait, maybe go up to 32, formalize that and see what's going on. Since one above 128 megabytes, um, that could be apparently for my not non program that non programmer understanding that could create a system in which node propagation is very slow so think about it like this it's your upload and download speed right now uh, uploading and downloading a you know 16 megabyte block not too big of a deal for miners however 128 megabytes could indeed pose some issues due to network latency just how fast they send this information between one another because of peer propagation or how nodes send information in geographically consistent ways um, think of it like going from Shanghai to Guangzhou, from Guangzhou over to um, Tibet, and then from Tibet over to Nepal, right? It would kind of go in that order due to geographical proximity. 128 megabytes, that could lead to some issues apparently. Some say yes, some say no, and that's why we're having the fork. So here we are, um, arrived at our topic of discussion for the day. Here's a you know, great little segment about the... Uh, the fuss over the fork, fussy fork, that's a good way to uh, describe it. And it just gives a brief summation, kind of what we just talked about. But nonetheless, if you want to get caught up on that, I recommend um, just going and checking out r backslash BTC over on Reddit. Uh, that's more of the Bitcoin Cash kind of uh, subreddit, but it also allows a lot of good debate. There are some, <clears throat> excuse me, are some partisan um, some partisan things I notice, and you know, a little bit of eco chamber stuff going on, but that's with any community. No, nothing's going to be perfect. This is life, right? Life is messy. It's how it is. But with that said, got some in in yeah, interesting information for you there. Uh, next up, we have why we should ditch GDP. This is I just found this article extremely enlightening. Found it on Zero Hedge. Jumped over to uh, Gold Money. Actually, no, this one wasn't from Zero Hedge. I found a related article from Gold Money on Zero Hedge, and then switched over to this one just because it was really enlightening. Fantastic read. Uh, it talks about just GDP as a uh, metric of societal success and how it is used to measure economic growth, how that didn't start until the 1990s before we use gross national product, GNP. Um, and that ex explains a lot as to why that's on you know, GDP slash GNP is on some older financial documents, on some older maps, that sort of thing. And it just talks about how this is a extremely useful tool <clears throat> for economists and global financiers, but definitely not a accurate measure of uh, economic activity. After all, it's not included um, in this article, but one figure that I saw uh, suggested that because medical expenditure is counted in United States GDP due to the expansive costs in the U.S., uh, medical expenditures account for between 20 and 30 percent of the entire United States GDP. Is spending money on medical expenditures, because you broke your leg, you got sick, uh, these sorts of things, that's not really the signs of a healthy economy per se. So with that said, I don't think that means that the United States is actually rotting from the ground up. That's uh, maybe with the infrastructure, yeah, you know, I mean, um, the bridges are kind of iffy, but the people, they seem pretty robust. But with that said, 20 to 30% of your GDP being measured by healthcare expenditure, it doesn't really offer an accurate representation of economic activity, but rather serves to be a very beneficial metric for the individuals in control of the global economy and domestic economies as well. So with that said, just wanted to share this article with you. It's a bit of a lengthy one. Uh, really interesting read, though. Great takeaway. So I'll put that below in the description, as always, guys. Uh, next up, we got Russia. Russia is changing from the SWIFT system. This is just something I wanted to briefly mention as well. Uh, this guy, Tom, uh, I was going to call him Lunugo, but it's Longo. Longo? Longo? I'm just going to call him Tom. <laughs> His last name always trips me up. Uh, Tom, great guy. Um, I don't know him personally, but I'm assuming he's a great guy. He does great work with uh, what he writes, but basically, Russia wants to move away from the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system is the communicative layer of global finance that allows for payment settlements in relative real time. Not, not quite real time, it's a bit clunky and slow, but nonetheless, in terms of uh, shipping global trade and global information, something like this is very necessary and important. Now, Russia being a not a global pariah as of yet, but definitely an economic pariah due to global sanctions, they're seeking to implement an alternative system that will allow nations to communicate financial information without being in direct control of the United States and Western authorities. This has huge implications for what's known as de-dollarization, in which the United States dollar moves away from its focal point as the um, global currency, the uh, globally accepted means of payment settlement, and we're seeing that more and more. Recently, Iran and Russia decided that they're going to do an oil deal completely in rubles. Uh, China and Russia have many, many commercial activities that were settled in Yuan as far back as 2014, 2015. So this is just an article I wanted to bring up 
put it in the description as well for you guys so you can get up to speed on exactly what's happening with global finance all around the world how these payment systems work and are intertwined and what geopolitical interests are at play and are associated with them so cool stuff uh, next up, I found this really hilarious. Hackers claim a breach of 120 million Facebook accounts. Facebook is over here just talking so much smack about crypto, but what they had stolen was their access tokens, which keeps people uh, logged into their accounts. So Facebook lost their own tokens. So that's that's a grand stroke of irony. What is not humorous, though, is the 120 million people who lost their account. That is not good. That sucks. So it goes to show that this is a huge, huge focus um, in everywhere every kind of digital system security security is so important <clears throat> if you build a calculator you probably don't need to have it that secure you don't need a sha-256 algorithm to secure that calculator's data but if you have say a 1 billion plus person database with tons of private information relating to each individual security is infinitely important it's been said that security is going to be the, the number one industry for the 21st century, and that could very well be true, considering that many uh, existing systems don't seem to have sufficient security, and what's known as script kiddies, or just young kids who have grown up in the digital era, digital natives as they're called as well, hacking for them is something that's fun and interesting trying to poke around and prod that's just what young folk do they want to find out about the world around them through experimentation and physical interaction and frankly digital mediums have become an extrapolation of physical interaction and have become highly integrated with the world around us so this is kind of the future so it's a it's it could be an accurate statement it could not only time will tell we're just here to observe some very interesting confluences in the world around us as we always enjoy doing together also, a recently released American Bread and Circus with Mike Maloney. Love this dude. His explanations are fantastic. This ties in really well to what we're talking about with the global fiat system, the United States dollar, and its, um, I guess, erosion as the global world currency. Fantastic series. Uh, Mike does a great job. Can't praise him enough for what the, what he's doing, the work he's doing. He says it in such a comprehensive, succinct way. You could sit your grandmother down and go through this series, and I have no doubt if she's interested in any any kind of sense of reality, she'd find this kind of thing digestible, engaging, and fun, frankly, to learn about the world that's going on around us. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into the happenings for November 5th. God, time flies, guys. We're getting up on the holidays. November 5th, let's go ahead and jump into that. What we have for November 5th, Monday, is Distributed Health 2018 happening in Tennessee. The Swiss Payment Forum happening in Zurich. Crypto Explorers, which is a very nice uh, semi-luxury cruise sort of thing where you go around the beautiful city of Zug, Switzerland. You also have the Frontiers in Cybersecurity happening in Chengdu. And the Web Summit happening in Lisbon. Next up for Tuesday, November 6th, we have the Toronto Family Office and High Net Worth Annual Conference in Toronto. Uh, there's been a couple of those, so I guess uh, when you have high net worth, you're able to have all kinds of offices. Pretty nice. Also, the Money Live Nordic Banking 2018 Conference has happened in Copenhagen? Copenhagen? I don't know. Danish friends, help me out. Point of the matter, that's where it is. Happening in Denmark. So, with that said, that's all we have for Tuesday, November 6th, and for this Crypto Coffee update. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Seriously, your support is very much appreciated. I read every comment. I've been very much enjoying the lively discussion we've been having um, on the EOS videos. Hopefully we can spark some of that discussion happening as well here on the uh, Crypto Coffee updates, maybe over in the Discord as well. Always good talks going on there. But with that said, much love. Thanks again. My name is Paul. We are Cryptide. And remember, the tide is rising, as is inflation, it seems.